Okay, hi everyone, good, good evening and welcome to tonight's webinar on the rock art of Galicia, which will be presented by Dr. Carlos Rodriguez Relan. Uh, before we start, I'd just like to give you a little bit of background to this talk. This webinar is organized by the Scotland's Rock Art Project. This is a five-year program working with communities across the country to record, research and raise awareness of prehistoric rock carvings in Scotland. The project is funded by the Arts and Humanities Research Council and is run by Historic Environment Scotland in collaboration with Edinburgh University and Glasgow School of Art. And we are very grateful to Glasgow School of Art for hosting this webinar on their Zoom account. Some of the Scotland's Rock Arts Project team are here this evening, so I introduce everyone. The project is led by Dr. Tersha Barnett from Historic Environment Scotland. Dr. Joanna vades Tullet is the postdoctoral research assistant. And Dr. Jeffrey, uh, sorry, Stuart Jeffrey and myself are co-investigator in the project. The Scotland's Rock Art Project started in 2017 and will end in December this year. We recently had our big final conference with a series of talks and panel discussions, which were all recorded and are now available on the project website. Tonight's talk is the fifth in a series of 12 webinars running throughout this year, one each month. The webinars are presented by experts from Britain and Europe on themes that are relevant to Scotland's rock art. You can find more details about the whole webinar series and uh, our other events on our website's events page. You can also find recordings of our previous webinars there. Before I introduce tonight's speaker, there are just a few housekeeping things to be aware of. So we are recording this talk and we'll post it on our website in a week or two. To avoid background noise, you would be muted throughout the webinar and your uh, videos will be turned off. Please use the chat box if you want to talk to each other. For example, if you want to tell us where you are joining us from tonight and to flag up any technical issues with the sound quality or anything. We would appreciate if you could keep the chat appropriate and relevant. So please do not post any URL links or click on any links that are not posted by us as they may be spam. Now, if you want to avoid the comments from the chat box popping up on your screen, you can keep the chat box open on the right hand side of your screen during the talk. If you want to ask the speaker a question, please don't use the chat box and use the Q&A question and answer box at the bottom of your screen. You can ask the speaker questions at any time during their talk, and I will put your questions to the speaker when they have finished their presentation. So chat box for chat, Q&A box for questions to the speaker. And now tonight for our first webinar, we're going to move out of Britain and Ireland and travel south to the region of Galicia in northwestern Spain. I'm very pleased to welcome our speaker, Dr. Carlos Rodriguez Relan, who is currently an assistant professor at the University of Lisbon. Carlos obtained his PhD in 2010 at the University of Santiago de Compostela and then held postdoc positions at Arizona State University in the US and at the Fondation Maison des Sciences de l'Homme in Paris. Carlos has multiple research interests. His PhD was on material culture and particularly on lithic industries made from unusual raw materials such as slate and quartz during the late prehistory of northwestern Spain. And last year he published an edited volume on green stones called A Taste for Green, a Global Perspective on Ancient Jade, Turquoise and Variside Exchange. Uh, but Carlos is also interested in prehistoric rock art, in particular Galician rock art, a topic on which he has published several 
articles. His research on rock art combines field survey and computer methods to explore the relationship between rock art and the landscape. Tonight, Carlos gives us a presentation on the topic of Northwestern Iberian rock art, state of the art, and recent developments. So thank you very much, Carlos. And whenever you're ready, you can start sharing your screen, which is now done, I think, and you can start your presentation. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, can you see the, the presentation uh, correctly? Yes, yes, we can. Okay, thank you very much, Guillaume. Well, uh, first of all, uh, thank you very much uh, to all the members of the Scotland Rock Art Project for having me this evening. And obviously, thank you very much to the audience uh, who has decided to spend a Monday evening listening to me talking about the rock art of a small corner of the Iberian Peninsula. Um, tonight, I intend to introduce you in a very concise way, I hope, <laughs> the main characteristics of the rock art of the northwest, uh, northwestern corner of the Iberian Peninsula, specifically of a Spanish region called Galicia where I conducted, uh, conducted much of my research uh, for the last uh, 20 years or so. So, um, to this end, I believe that, uh, I think that the only logical, um, it, it's only logical to begin with, uh, by describing the geographic uh, framework in which uh, the rock art is, uh, that is the subject of this conference is located. So, the Iberian Northwest, that you can see here uh, this, in this slide, is a geographic, uh, clima climatic, and geological region which, from a political point of view, compri uh, comprises portions of the territories of Spain and Portugal. Although, although there is no consensus on the strict limits of the Iberian Northwest, and here we, uh, we will use a rather strict definition, which identifies this region as all those territories located between the Atlantic Ocean in the, in, uh, to the west, the Cantabrian, the Cantabrian Sea to the north, the Douro Valley to the south, and its tributary, the Esla River here to the east. Um, regarding its orography, uh, the Northwest is a rather uh, mountainous region uh, with two mountain ranges standing out. The Easter Sierras that you see here, um, a series of peaks that reach a maximum elevation of 2,100 meters above the, uh, above the sea level, or more or less 7,000 feet. And these Eastern Sierras, uh, Sierras have isolated the, um, a portion of the Northwest from the rest uh, of the uh, Iberian Peninsula, so that for much of their history, the communities who settled this territory relate on the sea as, the, as their main way of communication with the rest of the world. This quote by Juan Camba, a Galician journalist of the late 19th century and first half of the, the 20th century, is a quite eloquent uh, of this isolation between the Northwest and the Iberian inland. As you can see, one of the causes that determines the Galician immigration to America is this. It is easier to go to America from Galicia than to go to Madrid. When a Galician ventures to Madrid, it is with the firm intention of becoming a, a minister. Any other position lower than that will not compensate for the fatigues of the journey. So, um, the, as you can see, these, um, these mountains here separate and seclude both areas, both the northwest from the uh, Spanish meseta or Spanish tableau. Um, the other mountain ranges of relevance are, uh, in the northwest are those that constitute the dorsal meridiana or the meridian ridge. As you can see, we are not very original when it comes to naming our mountains. And this dorsal meridiana and the Peneda Xerés uh, in, in Sierras in Portugal are also much lower in altitude than the eastern Sierras, around only 1,100 uh, 1, meters above the sea level or more or less. Uh, 3,600 3, feet, they have been a barrier within the Northwest throughout much of its history. And its influence can be seen in the megalithic phenomenon of the region, the distribution of um, specific artifacts such as flint blades, and of course, 
in the characteristics of the rock art as we will uh, as we shall see uh, below at the same time the orientation of these mountains you know, as you can see um, has uh, conditioned the way in which people move as well as the interconnections between communities we, with a large part of the contacts uh, being made in a, no, in a, in a north-south or south-north uh, direction, while the great rivers such as the Duero, Douro and the Miño um, were used as the main routes of communication towards the, the inland. Um, as regards to the coast, the northwest uh, has a very regular and rugged uh, coastline. It's more than 1,500 kilometers of shoreline, that is more or less 930 miles, are practically equivalent in extension to the entire Mediterranean coast of the Iberian Peninsula, from the Pyrenees to the Strait of Gibraltar. The coastline combines massive cliffs, some of the highest in, the con uh, in continent continental Europe, which have posed a great danger to seafaring, as can be de uh, deduced from the fact that part of these coasts were called the coast of death by the British sailors, and also a series of bays or inlets, that you see here, called rias, which provide a safe haven. You see here the images of one of these rias, one of these inlets. Um, as I said before, this distinctive uh, orography has affected the spatial arrangement of prehistoric rock art, with most of the petroglyphs or engraved rocks found around the hills uh, that overlook these rias. You can see here, especially in the rias vices. You see all the petroglyphs here, and you see, can see here the cluster, uh, the clusters around these uh, these rias vices. You you may also note. Uh, how different sierras have actually played a role in containing, so to speak, the spirit of this phenomenon further inland, especially the western sierras. Um, although the Northwest is a single entity from a geographical and archaeological point of view, the modern political borders have played an obviously uh, important role in the study of rock art with the Portuguese and Spanish researchers focusing on studying the rock art on the respective side of the border. In fact, only a few researchers have addressed this area in a unified way, as it has been the case, for example, with Joanna's doctoral dissertation, which I hope it will be followed by other works in the future. So, as another victim, or perhaps perpetrator of this dynamic, I will be focusing my lecture on the Spanish side of the northwestern Iberia, in the autonomous region, region of Galicia. As you can see in this map, Galicia comprises little more than tw uh, 25,000 uh, square kilometers, a little over 1,000 uh, square uh, feet, which makes Galicia roughly equivalent to the 38% of the size of the Scotland. You can see here the, the comparison. Not in vain, Galicia has uh, traditionally been known as the Spanish Ireland or the Spanish Scotland, not only because of uh, our green landscapes or due to the fact that our traditional instrument being the, bap, the bagpipe, but mainly because it rains a lot. In fact, although it might be hard to believe for some of you, it rains twice as much as in Scotland, as you can see in this graph. So, um, have, um, having taken an intro, um, one on one course, an introductory course on the Iberian Northwest and particularly on Galicia, let's, uh, let's take a look at some of the basic uh, characteristics of its prehistoric rock art, which is, uh, I guess, in what, in what you are interested in. Um, the current territory of Galicia that you are seeing here in this map concentrates up, um, approximately uh, the 90% of the petroglyphs or rock art sites known uh, nowadays in the northwest of the Iberian Peninsula, with the, uh, with the vast majority, as I already said, of the engraved, uh, engraved rock art clustered in, the, in this southwestern sector, more or less matching the limits of the provincia of Pontevedra, here around the Rias Baixas. Um, however, until very recently, uh, the number of um, catalog petroglyphs in Galicia was not known in detail. 
throughout the 20th century and the first decade, uh, decade of the 21st and the 21st century, different authors proposed diverse numbers of great rock, uh, uh, rock art sites. Um, however, the analysis carried, uh, carried out by, our, by us in the, on the catalogs or, or based on the catalogs of the Galician regional government showed that the number of catalog petroglyphs, in fact, is much, much higher than previously believed. As you can see, in 2006, um, it, it was believed that only uh, um, the, 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 the Rocard catalog was comprised of only 1,000 petroglyphs. When, and when we analyzed the, the, the official catalog uh, of the Junta de Galicia, we found, uh, we found out that this number, this number was 3,374. And um, since then, the number has continued, uh, continue, uh, continue, excuse me, has uh, continued to grow. Currently, standing around uh, three thousand and eight hundred rocks, so nearly uh, um, four thousand rocks. However, it's highly likely that the final number of rock art sites will be much higher. Thus, our project projections, uh, based on the density of petroglyphs no nowadays suggests uh, that there might be up to 5,500 or even 6,000 rock art sites only in the Galician territory. So um, if such numbers are finally reached, the Iberian Northwest might be one of the largest concentrations of open, uh, open air rock art in continental Europe. As you can see here the uh, confidence interval. Um, And also, as you can see in this slide, the Galician rock art catalog is not only um, uh, high in number, but also diverse regarding the motifs represented uh, therein. Thus, in other Atlantic, uh, as in other Atlantic regions, including, including Scotland, there is a dominant geometric group composed mainly of, of cup marks, caps and rings and ring marks. Um, um, and in addition to this, uh, there are another motifs um, traditionally referred as naturalistic that include uh, depictions of animals, mainly deer, but also horses, dogs, and other un unidentified quadrupeds. Together with these animals, there are also depictions of metallic weapons, mostly daggers and halberds, but also what has been interpreted as representations of shields, scutiformes, in, in Spanish. Also, um, part of the naturalistic group, even though we have included uh, them within the prehistoric area, prehistoric uh, diverse, um, there are, um, the, we can find the, the depictions of humans, uh, sometimes uh, uh, welding weapons, hunting or riding horses, or even uh, riding deer or what has been called uh, or considered um, idols, representations of idols, you can see here, and also sheep and many other uh, figures. Finally, there is also a significant number of engravings that will have made much more recently in historical times, such as crosses, game boards, or letters. Many of these historical motifs, especially the crosses, appear on the same rocks as the prehistoric engravings, prob probably with the purpose of Christianizing an element that was recognized as alien by the Catholic Church. Um, here you can see some of these uh, some samples of this uh, rock art. Um, for example, the Lasje Ferrada petroglyph in the Lugo province. Some of the, of the ring marks, as this one or the one depicted in Monte Teton in Pontevedra, can exceed the, the two meters in diameter, more or less uh, 78 inches in diameter. As you can see here, this is really a huge, uh, uh, huge um, um, uh, motif. Here you can see another um, motif, um, um, double uh, ring mark. Other, um, other motifs, figurative motifs, for example, uh, representations of, of deer, as you can see here. Uh, um, this is a Beira da Costa, petroglyph in A Coruña, and is one of the largest, together with, uh, with the one in Lasia dos Carvalhos, this one here, uh, you can see here. Um, this, both these um, 
Beira a costa en laxe dos carballos, both exceeding one meter in height. So they are really, really big. We can also find small representations of deer and of animals. And sometimes we found even huge clusters of animals in the same rock. For example, we have rocks with more than 50 animals carved or depicted in a single rock. Mm. Also, um, the aforementioned representations of, we of weapons, such as this of the petrolif of Coto de Aspra in Pontevedra, where uh, you can see the depiction of several halberds here, 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 mm. and also uh, daggers and in what has been called a panoply rock, because actually it depicts a um, huge number of, of, of weapons, as you can see. Also, um, also, comparatively fewer in number, we can also find representations of labyrinths, such as this one from Mogor in Pontevedra province. Um, the presence of this type of figures of labyrinths has been used by some authors uh, to support the hypothesis of at least a part of the geometric uh, engravings of the Galician petroglyph will be dated to the Iron Age when this area of the Iberian Peninsula begins to experience the Mediterranean influences, mainly thanks to the Phoenician merchants. Um, finally, uh, you can see also here some examples of, um, of historical um, motives. La Ferrada again, is, uh, you, you can see, for example, horseshoes, crosses, and also depictions of those that might be the representation maybe of the Holy Spirit. There are clear differences in the, in the type of the group uh, of, of these historical uh, motifs, as you can see here, comparing it, for example, with this prehistoric uh, uh, figure of a, of a um, cup ring. Um, for example, the prehistoric, um, the prehistoric groups are much more rounded and, uh, and with an open section, while uh, the, pre the historic, um, the historic uh, motifs show a B section and fresh, uh, fresh edges. You can see here clearly the differences between both type of, of motifs. Um, as I have noted in one of the previous slides, the geometric group, you can see here, the, 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 the percentage of, of each group, of main group, geometric, naturalistic, historical, uh, and so on. And um, also the numbers of specific figures like cup marks, ring marks, uh, cups and rings, crosses, and so on and so forth. Um, so the geometric group is the most, uh, the most uh, num numerous in the Galician rock art, being present in more than the 80% of the engraved rocks. Within this group, cup marks are uh, the most common motifs, followed by ring marks and, 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 cup, and cups and rings. This group, this geometric group, is, follow, is followed by the engravings of historical chronology, as you can see here, present in almost 28% of the petroglyphs. And um, finally, the uh, figurative motifs with only uh, little more than 11%. Um, these uh, figurative motifs, motifs, animals and weapons, are considered to be the to, so to speak, the differentiated factor of the prehistoric rock art of northwestern Iberia within the framework of the so-called Atlantic rock art. Well, so in other areas of this Atlantic rock art, such as in Scotland and, uh, and Ireland, you find mostly uh, geometric motifs. Here in northwestern Spain, you find also natural, naturalistic, but these are only a small percentage of the of the catalog, as, as in other areas of, of the of the Atlantic facade, um, as you can see, the geometric are the are the commanding for, for saying the commanding uh, group. Um, however, we must take into account that these uh, percentages uh, also they certainly show the clear predominance of geometric motifs over figurative. Um, they probably do not accurately reflect the real importance of the different groups and motives. And this is for a reason. Uh, in this sense, you can see that the considerable we uh, weathering that many of the petroglyphs uh, have undergone 
uh, after thousands of years in the open, has made many of these uh, engravings very difficult to observe nowadays. You can see here uh, that are very, very difficult to, 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 to see. In some cases, the motifs are only revealed after the rock surface has been enhanced using digital te techniques such as photogrammetry or 3D scan. Um, as elsewhere in Europe, the use of uh, photogrammetric or 3D scans has only recently begun to be applied to rock art in, in Galicia. So that three-dimensional models are available for only a small number of engraved rocks. On the other hand, the, tot the total number of petroglyphs for which we have a more or less reliable tracing, three-dimensional or otherwise, does not exceed 1,000. So we have comparatively um, a reduced number of tracings or, or, or graphical documentations for our petroglyphs. Um, for those rocks for which we have tracings using different techniques, we see how this profoundly determine the number of motifs that, uh, that uh, are identified. Here we see the photogrammetric model of the petroglyph of Fossa la Bella in La Coruña, and the motifs documented in, a, in the first analysis of the rock conducted in the 70s are marked in red. So in red, the motifs that were um, identified in the, in the first analysis conducted on the rock using a simple uh, freehand sketch technique. Um, then uh, in blue, uh, we see the engravings in, identified using artific uh, artificial lights. Okay, the, tra the tracing, you can see here one of the images. And the tracing was done at night using high power uh, flashlights. And finally, uh, you can see in, um, you can see in uh, purple uh, uh, the results of the analysis made in enhancing the three-dimensional models created using structure for motion from motion uh, photogrammetry. So for, uh, both the, tra the tracing using artifi artificial lights and the, and the photogrammetry uh, allowed the, the identification of a significant number of motives mm -hmm. they uh, that they had gone unnoticed during the first analysis of the rock. So, you can see how our um, the, the analysis using artificial light so photogrammetry allows us to to identify, for example, three new daggers, and, and um, also a cap and ring and a uh, um, snake-shaped figure. So, the um, as I say, the te the different techniques used um, and, and profoundly determine the number of motifs that are, that are identified. Even more spectacular are the results achieved in the nearby petroglyph of Osmochos. Here you can see the, there our tracing using artif artificial lights and made possible to find some of the biggest human representations in the prehistoric rock art of northwestern Iberia, the, lar the largest of which you can see here is about um, um, one meter high, like 39 inches. And it seems to be wielding some kind of object in his hands, perhaps a weapon. A third analysis of the rock using a photogrammetric en enhanced model allow us to see that two of the human figures that you see here um, had a more complex design that initially identified. And it's even possible to appreciate here the superposition of a fourth human figure. So, the incomplete reading of the engraved panels tends to affect the figurative motifs to a greater extent, since for some unknown reason, these tend to be much more eroded, make it, uh, making their identification much more difficult. So um, in light of what we have uh, just seen, the overall distribution of groups and motifs within the prehistoric rock art of Northwest Iberia will probably remain unchanged over the next few decades. Uh, um, with the geometrical group dominating the whole. But it's very li uh, likely uh, that with the increase of digital models, we will see a significant increase in the percentage of figurative motives. This uh, such seems to be the case uh, in the only Galician district in which uh, photogrammetric models uh, of all its, ro uh, its rock sites have been implemented. Here, you see by Sominio, it's like a shire in southern Galicia. Um, on Alia Vázquez Mar uh, Martínez, uh, 
um, within the framework, uh, framework of, of her uh, doctoral dissertation, um, she um, made, um, she conducted the, the digital um, models of uh, every petroglyphs in this, in this area. And uh, the fieldwork allowed not only to identify more than 200 new rock art sites, but also to increase the number and variability of the motifs due to the identification of new patterns, especially figurative, uh, that had gone unnoticed in former, uh, in former uh, analysis. So, uh, also probably the geometrical group is going, is, it will be remain the, 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 the most numerous. Problem, we, sh we shall expect that the, the percentage of the, of the significance of the, of the figurative um, group is going to grow in the, in the near future due to, due to the use of these uh, new techniques. Um, um, regarding the, 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 the special dimension of rock art, um, now that we have seen some of the basics of the, of the rock art of Galicia, um, the spatial dimension of rock art and its role in shaping the landscapes and territories of prehistoric community has been one of the aspects that has received most attention in research over the last decades. Um, uh, in terms of their general distribution throughout the Northwest, we, already, we have already seen how rock art sites are mainly clustered um, around the Southwest of Galicia. Um, the, near the so-called Rias Baixas here, with a significant reduction in their numbers as we move inland, especially after crossing the Dorsal Meridiana. So um, here you can see that the, the, the global um, arrangement, spatial arrangement of the, of the Galician rock art. However, um, it's, this general distribution is also strongly determined by the geology of, uh, or lithology of the region. Um, Galician rock art was mainly engraved on granite, which only a small number of them present on another lithologies, mainly slate or schist. Thus, almost, uh, thus almost 85% of the Galician rock art sites are located within uh, granitic uh, formations, as you can see here. So they um, strongly uh, determine the, the overall distribution of um, of rock art sites in Galicia. Uh, however, uh, within this general distribution of rock art, um, um, we can see important difference. Uh, uh, these are mainly found between the geometric and the, nat uh, the naturalistic groups, uh, with the latter, with the naturalistic groups, restricted to the southwestern se uh, sector of Galicia. You can see here in the animals and the weapons, which are um, which are uh, clustered around the Rias Vices, as I already said. While the geometric group has some compar uh, comparatively uh, much more ubiquitous uh, distribution, you know, much more ex uh, extensive distribution, extending beyond the meridian reach here uh, into the interior of Galicia and even surpassing the limits of Galicia. So uh, this kind of, um, of uh, art can be found, for example, in Asturias and in Castilla y León. Uh, the, other um, um, re regions uh, in the vicinity of Galicia. Um, this different ge uh, geographical distribution of the naturalistic and geometric gro groups can be noted in the, them in the thematic uh, the diversity of ri or richness uh, of the Galician rock art. Thus, the presence of uh, figurative motifs in the southwest of Galicia shows that this area around the Rias Baixas is not only that with the greatest number of rock art sites, but also the one with the greatest thema uh, thematic diversity, with the uh, highest diversity of, of, of figures. Um, in this sense, and in the light of the distribution of the rock art now today, it seems that as we other archeological uh, phenomena, the meridian ridge that you, you can see here, um, seems to have acted as some kind of barrier um, hindering the, the expansion of the figurative group towards inland Galicia. So you can see how uh, eloquent is this difference between, you know, the west uh, part of the of Galicia and the east uh, eastern part of Galicia. Um, as I said before, um, the spatial dimension of rock art has been one of the objects of. Uh, 
or one of the major subjects of interest among the researchers of Galician rock art over the last uh, decade, uh, over the last three decades. Uh, and this is due in part to the huge influence that the work by Richard Bradley had in this region. As uh, some of you might know, Richard carried out fieldwork in the northwest of the Iberian Peninsula, which resulted in the publication of several papers and books. Perhaps the most influential is the one you see here, published in 1997. In this book, Richard pointed to rock art as a mechanism intrinsically uh, related to the definition of the preferential use of specific part of, uh, parts of the prehistoric landscape by the not yet fully sedentary agricultural, uh, agricultural uh, groups of the area. These groups will have used the petroglyphs as a way of uh, managing, so to speak, uh, and regulating access to specific territories that will be very valuable uh, to them, from, uh, both from an economic or symbolic point of view, and thus potentially desirable for neighboring communities. As markers, petroglyphs will be intended to be noticed and will therefore be placed near key transit points across the landscape, as you can see here. Um, so the petroglyphs and Galicia will, ha will thus have been located on the hillsides overlooking these agricultur agriculturally fertile valleys, mm -hmm. uh, while at the same time controlling the routes uh, connecting these valleys with the heights of the mountain ranges, where, um, which will have provided abundant grazing and water for the cattle during the summer months, as you can see here. As I said before, Richard's wall, uh, work had an enormous influence among the Galician researchers who over the following decades focused on unraveling the specificities of the spatial distribution of Galician rock art. Um, however, um, during our field work on the, on the rock art of central Galicia and specifically of the Barbanza Peninsula that you can see here, uh, one of these uh, peninsulas formed by the existence of the small inlets uh, that constitute the Rias Baixas. Mm, here. So um, our fieldwork uh, here pointed out that such notion of rock art as a landscape marker intended to be noticed did not quite match the picture we saw on the field. Mm. Thus, in the, in the Barbanza Peninsula, although there, uh, there are petroglyphs that were seemingly intended to be seen and perceived from a distance, the vast majority of them are practically invisible after a distance of only 100 meters. So this suggests that the audience of the Galician rock art might not have been as wide as previously uh, thought, and that many petroglyphs were in fact engraved in quite secluded spaces that could only be reached if their exact location was known beforehand. Um, this suspicion was confirmed when we began to find petroglyphs displaying cap marks, ring marks, or animals inside small rock shelters. So, this, that, uh, this, uh, this um, petroglyphs in rock and rock, inside rock shelters contradict to some, to some extent this notion of um, petroglyphs uh, as landscape markers, since they were impossible to see. Uh, from a distance, uh, you know, beyond 10 or, or 20 meters. Um, at the same time, the generalization of new analytical tools, such as the GIS or statistics, allow us to approach the spatial analysis of Galician rock art from a new and more powerful way. Thus, one of the first things we did was to collect all the variables and that had been pointed out over the years by the spe uh, specialists as potentially significant in explaining the distribution of rock art. So we um, we uh, check all the all the you know all the, um, the books and all the all the papers uh, related with uh, with uh, the spatial arrangement arrangement of, of Galician rock art, and we selected all the variables um, mentioned by the by the different authors. And you can see here some of them, and, and we then perform statistical analysis such as predictive modeling to determine which of these variables actually explain the distribution of rock art on the, on the Barranza Peninsula. 
The results show that many of the variables pointed out by the authors in the past have not explanatory power over the distribution of petroglyphs in the area. For example, neither the proximity to paths, to traditional paths, nor the accumulations of water were significant in explaining the presence of rock art in a given place. Uh, the variables that did prove to be significant were much more gener general, such as uh, type of rock, uh, mainly gra granite, as we saw, the inclination and orientation of the slope, among others that I have not included here. The apparent lack of a spatial relationship between petroglyphs and the transit routes was particularly striking since it seemed to contradict the role of petroglyphs as landmark uh, markers intended to be seen by people moving across the landscape. So, uh, in order to, to check this spatial relationship between rock art and movement, we calculate nearly 6,000 least uh, coast paths, areas along which it could have been easier to walk uh, using GIS, as you can see here, and subsequently, we define those areas in which the intensity or density of those paths was higher, like, for example, here, here. Mm -hmm. Establishing a way for detecting, so to speak, potential theoretical transit key points in the landscape. Um, we therefore compare the, spa the spatial relationship between the petroglyphs and such key transit points for the sake of comparing we uh, also included the megaliths in our analysis. You can see the megaliths here in orange, while the petroglyphs are in, depicted in red dots. Um, and uh, we included the, 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 um, included the megaliths in our analysis, since as the petroglyphs, these monuments have been also traditionally considered to have act as landscape markers. The results were quite clear. While the megaliths are always located over or nearby the major key transit areas, the rock are sites tend to be located away from them or the most near secondary routes. It's a clear difference between how um, megaliths behave and petroglyphs behave regarding the proximity of these uh, major uh, key transit points. Subsequently, we try to analyze if petroglyphs were actually perceptible from the transit paths. So, can they be seen from these paths? For this, we use these two GIS tools and high resolution maps, like this five, uh, five, uh, 50 centimeter slider, which allow us to erase, to, uh, so to speak, the vegetation and therefore gave us a clean perspective of what is visible and what is not. Uh, we then applied what we call an inverse view sheet analysis. That is, we calculated the view sheet not from the petroglyphs, but from the paths towards the, the rock art sites. Mm -hmm. You can see here the paths. So we calculated thousands, tens of thousands actually, of view sheet um, from different points uh, um, along these, uh, these paths. Here, for example, you can see one of these maps with the yellow areas marking the portion of the landscape, which is actually visible from the paths. And the results confirm that at least half of the petroglyphs cannot be viewed from the near or least coast paths. Um, no significant um, difference was found, uh, was found between the variable, this variable and the type, um, the type of motifs represented on the petroglyph. This is uh, relevant because, for example, Richard in his, in, in his uh, book tend to, um, to um, um, relate cap marks with those um, less, um, with those more, more re, um, secluded or remote uh, petroglyphs. But what we see in our analysis is that in, no matter what, uh, what type of, uh, of motifs you, you, uh, the, the petroglyphs are representing, at least half of them are not visible from, the, from these uh, paths. Uh, according to our results, uh, the threshold for a, for a petroglyph to be visible from the paths will have been around 280 meters, mm? so more or less 300 yards. The petroglyphs located farther away from these routes will have been really very difficult to perceive. Um, 
similarly, uh, the analysis of the cumulative view sheet of the landscape, that is how visible or how conspicuous a specific area will be from the surrounding landscape, shows that unlike barrows, again, the barrows here, uh, um, petroglyphs tend to be located in remote, uh, relative, uh, relatively self-enclosed areas with low or very low accumulative view sheet values. As you can see here, it's quite striking. Obviously, uh, there are always some exceptions, but most of the petroglyphs are located in these areas of very low uh, accumulative view sheet, uh, suggesting, as I told you, that uh, most of them are um, were located in uh, secluded spaces. Um, however, as well as their, as, um, their more or less remote location, there are other aspects of the, that might have regulated the levels of perceptibility of rock art sites. For example, the size and inclination of both the rock and the engraved panels, or the contrast between the newly um, uh, made grooves and the rock surface might have helped to increase or to reduce the conspicuousness of the engravings. You know? However, these variables um, are very difficult to analyze using static methods such as GIS tools. So it's very difficult to, to simulate or to analyze this kind of variables using only GIS. So we use um, um, other different approaches, spe specifically, specifically computer simulations of or agent-based modeling. And so we create um, create an um, artificial wall to say, to, to, um, you know, of the Barbanza Peninsula, and we we um, settle this artificial wall with a uh, with um, artificial agent agents called walkers who had the, the mission of walking around and perceiving petroglyphs with a, a complex a set of mechanisms that I'm not describing here because it's quite complex. And, and, and then we, um, we consider several of these variables, such as the size and inclination, the contrast uh, of the surface. And what we found is that, in fact, both, as was expected, the size of the rocks containing petroglyphs or the inclination of the rock art panel had some role in the in the in the petroglyphs being perceived. So we have to obviously consider not only the uh, not only the, the remoteness of the petroglyph of the location of the petroglyph, but also the uh, size of the rock and the inclination of the grave panel, um, and also the contrast between um, the fresh. Uh, the, fre the, the fresh uh, groups and the, the surface of the rock um, sh uh, show to be uh, significant. Uh, uh, so with, uh, with a high contrast between the uh, engravings and the surface of the rock, then the probability of being, uh, of being perceived um, is, is higher. So also the color of the, of the rock has to be taken into account if we want to consider uh, the, the audience to, to which uh, these petroglyphs were intended. Um, still, our models uh, suggest that most of the petroglyphs will have gone unnoticed by people walking around in the prehistoric landscape, with only a few uh, having really um, having really been systematically perceived. So we we see here a power law distribution with most of the petroglyphs uh, not seen a single time and then only a small number being seen a, a huge number of times you have to take in, take into account that we made more or less 10,000 10,000 10, simulations of this so 600 seems a lot but the 600 out of 10,000 simulation is actually a small number okay in summary, our analysis uh, suggests that the petroglyphs do not seem to have uh, conceived, uh, to have been conceived for a, sing a single type of audience. While some of them will have been conceived to be easily perceived, others seem to have been hidden from all but the eyes of an expert audience who will know where they were located. Probably members of the same community or communities responsible for their engravings. 
So uh, finally, um, just to 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 to, to find to, to finish my my um, my um, short introduction on, on northwestern Iberian rock art, and I I want to tackle some hard uh, aspects of the, of the of the of this uh, rock art, which is uh, the, the 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 chronological definition, mm -hmm. uh, the correct and above all the detailed. Uh, chronological contextualization uh, of the rock art is one of the less known and probably for a reason most debate aspects of the rock art of the northwestern corner of the Iberian Peninsula. So, um, regarding the the, the, um, the chronology of these uh, of these manifestations, there there has been a it, it's been a, a, a bone of contention between the between the, the, the researchers. Uh, most scholars agree. In considering rock art as a long-lasting phenomenon in northwestern Iberia, probably going as far back as the Middle Neolithic, circa 3,500 BC, and subsequently lasting until the 20th century, actually, until present times. The key difference, however, lies in identifying the time at which the climax of engraving uh, of engraving activity took place. While most researchers date this peak between the end of the third millennium and the second millennium, that is in the local Bronze Age, other scholars place this peak in the first millennium BC, that is during the Iron Age, more or less here. So part of the researchers locate the peak of engraving activity here, while others put it here. Um, they both um, sides in this in this quarrel uh, use the same time of arguments to defend their position. One of the most important of these is the representation of objects whose actual model is known, such as, for example, weapons or the so-called idols. Uh, as we have already shown, the weapons depicted in the petroglyphs of northwestern Iberia are mostly me uh, metallic artifacts, such as daggers and halberds. Unfortunately, these subjects, especially halberds, are very scarce in the northwest, and their exact chronology is not well known in the region. In the region, excuse me. However, um, there is little, uh, little doubt that the Galician petroglyphs are depicting metal artifacts whose appearance in the archaeological record of the Iberian Peninsula can be dated to around the last quarter of the third millennium, whereas the late Bronze and early Iron Age antenna swords are conspicuously absent. So the models, the, 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 the weapons we have uh, depicted on the, uh, on the petroglyphs, even when we don't know the sag chronology uh, of these artifacts in the Northwest, in, in the rest of the Iberian Peninsula, these artifacts are date around the end of the third millennium, that is in the beginning of the uh, Bronze Age. The idols, uh, uh, the other objects that seem to be represented, here you, have, uh, you can see an idol, uh, a representation of an idol, and here an actual idol. Uh. Um, these idols, um, these idols um, are also absent from the, from the, from the northwest uh, Iberian region. Um, they are um, practically non-existing in this region being much more common in the south of the Iberian Peninsula, for example, in the uh, Portuguese territory during the third millennium BC onwards. So um, in Galicia and in northern Portugal, there are artifacts that are similar to insights and morphology to these uh, specific uh, um, idols um, guarding the access of some passage graves so that a chronology can be pointed out to these artifacts between 3,500 and 2700, without ruling out, of course, that they might have last until the end of the third millennium BC. So again, they tend to pinpoint these, um, these um, representations around the third millennium BC. Um, another reference, for example, a Polish stone disc uh, found in a small burial mount in the province of A Coruña. It's also re relevant because, as you can see here, the so-called Rechaba disc. Uh, uh, because uh, the obvious similar, uh, similarities with some geometric motifs present in rock art sites in northwest Iberia. This is quite, cl quite, um, quite clear. 
this is this disc displays some mesial perforation a hole here yeah, and which is surrounded by five small circular uh, hollows and three concentric circles engraved on each of the faces yeah, two more circles in the on the side of the piece this artifact has been dated to a to a um, later phase of the megalithic phenomenon of the northwestern Iberia at the end again of the third millennium BC. Um, other arguments used to establish the chronology of rock art are the similitudes between uh, steams depicted in petroglyphs such as does this and those decorating the, the interior of megalithic monuments such this of uh, Orca dos Xuncais in Viseu in Portugal. This is the case of the hunting scenes, uh, again, of the megalithic Orca dos Xuncais in Viseu and the petroglyph of Pedro de Sestosa. Both of them show a hunting sting in which one, you can see here, one human figure or several human figures, at least two, yeah, this is almost banished, but you can see, um, are, at, uh, are attempting to, uh, to hunt several male deer, several stags, one using what seems to be uh, a spear and the other two using arrows. Uh, in both cases, the human figures seem to be assisted by smaller animals, you can see here, here, with long tails and long um, ears, which have been interpreted as dogs. Uh, finally, in the case of Orca dos Xuncais, the entire um, steam, the entire composition is dominated by a partially uh, preserved figure that you can see here marked in yellow, that seems to mediate between the hunters and the wild animals uh, in, the, in the middle. And this figure has been interpreted as a protective or perhaps a propitiatory deity. In Pedra da Sestosa, uh, we have here this uh, poorly preserved figure that can be also, uh, that is also standing between the, um, uh, the, 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 the human figure and the, uh, and the stack and maybe also representing some kind of a similar concept that this one, okay? Um, obviously, um, besides this, all this, uh, of these resources, the, the main source for determining the chronology of rock art sites in, is the archaeological excavation, as, as is obvious. Although several of such interventions have been carried out in Galicia, more or less 20 in the last uh, 30 years, they are still very rare, uh, 30 out of more than uh, 3,000 petroglyphs is a small uh, percentage. Uh, moreover, in many cases, the finds recovered in these uh, archaeological interventions have been few and not very diagnostic from a chronological point of view, mostly quartz flakes, boulders with evidence of percussion, probably used in the process of engraving panels, mm -hmm. And this scarcity of finds might be due to the fact that most of the petroglyphs are located in shallow soils of what we call polycyclic nature, subject to repeated erosion and deposition processes that made the preservation of archaeological remains very difficult. In some cases, however, it has been possible to identify the remains of structures, and you can see here, for example, post holes, fire structures, or stone pavings. And even uh, we, we will be able to obtain several radiocarbon, uh, radiocarbon dates. The results of these uh, uh, radiocarbon dates and other, uh, other evidences of these excavations suggest that the activity around these rocks will have taken place mainly between the mid third uh, millennium, uh, millennium and the mid uh, second millennium, that is more or less between the 2500 and the 1500 uh, BC. Therefore, in short, both the models of the objects uh, represented in the petroglyphs and the human activity, activity detected in the surroundings of the rock art sites um, seem to place the peak of the engraving activity of the petroglyphs during the third and the second millennia BC, without ruling out, of course, uh, the sixth, the existence of rock art being produced in early and also much later times. 
So, um, in summary, um, what we can uh, say about the, 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 the actual uh, level of knowledge about the, about the prehistoric rock art of Galicia is that uh, the rock art catalog of Northwestern Iberia is still not completely known. The, num the total number of sites is likely to reach in the future, uh, or even exceed, 5,000 rocks. Um, new recording techniques uh, will increase probably the variability of the engraved motifs, especially of the, uh, of the uh, figurative uh, group, mm -hmm. and also the spatial statistics and computation, uh, computational simulation are helping us to better understand the role of the rock art in the landscape. Um, uh, uh, these uh, these um, studies um, that are progressing um, also show a growing uh, significant uh, uh, level of internal variability and complexity within the rock art phenomenon. And, and regarding the chronology, uh, finally, um, there is still much work to be done, especially regarding more excavations and also making probably um, paleoclimatic and, um, and uh, other kind of, um, of, um, of um, uh, studies trying to, uh, to, to, to detect the uh, human signature on the landscape, which might help us to understand when the uh, surrounding landscapes of the Petrotes were being, uh, uh, were being exp uh, explored. So uh, with all, uh, thank you very much uh, for your attention. I think I'm just in time. That's great. Thank you. Thank you so much, Carlos. The, the presentation was splendid visually and, and so informative that I think myself and a lot of people I saw in the chat were really impressed by the, uh, the amount of very useful results that you got from your, from your research. So uh, let's, Let's go to the questions now. And um, as, as you can see, there you have a lot of questions in the uh, in the Q and A box. I'm going to uh, I'm probably going to select because we probably won't have time to go through all of them. So perhaps I'm going to start with the uh, the more general ones, and then if we have time, we can go down to the to the more specific ones. So uh, there's a question from Andrew who is asking whether there are, there are any evidence of connections with the Phoenicians, such as similar motifs. That's something I think you, you mentioned yeah. with the, uh, the labyrinth. No, no. Uh, okay, so there are, um, there are in fact, um, part, part of the, of the so there are, as, you, uh, if, as you remember, I, I talk about ships, the representations of ships. Well, some of the representation of ships um, now they are the, the, their, their number their num their number is growing. The researchers have found like six or seven more in northern Portugal, and much of, many of these uh, ships are representing are have clear Mediterranean uh, free, uh, features are not Atlantic. Okay, this is quite is quite, is quite clear. So it's it's. Um, it's obvious that at least a part of the of the petroglyphs were uh, engraved uh, during the first millennium BC. Okay, and maybe these uh, these mazes, these labyrinths, uh, are a, an example of these uh, of these uh, connections, if you, if you want to call that that way. In fact, there are labyrinths, for example, in, in uh, representations of labyrinths in Iron Age hill forts. Okay, with mm -hmm. Uh, with um, Mediterranean uh, um, artifacts in in, in, the, in the same place, so we we cannot rule out the influence of the Mediterranean of the Mediterranean uh, wall, uh, to, to say it in a in a global way, um, and and maybe the presence of this of these uh, mazes of these labyrinths is uh, evidence of such uh, connections. For sure, we we can see, we can trace. The presence of the Phoenicians in the in the northwest of Spain around the seventh century BC, so seven or maybe eighth century BC. Okay, so as I as I told you, 
since the petroglyphs were engraved probably from the Neolithic, uh, the Middle Neolithic onwards until the, the 20th century, it's quite um, probably that uh, part of the petroglyphs were engraved during the first millennium, and maybe some of them were these maces and these ships, which represent probably what the people were seeing, you know, these, these uh, Medi Mediterranean vessels, and also maybe the, the the relationship you know between um, ideologies maybe I don't know and with the representation of maces that are clearly a Mediterranean a Mediterranean uh, motif. So uh, yes, um, the the presence of 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 of, um, of Phoenicians can be traced back at least of the, uh, to the seventh century BC, but um, not uh, much uh, much uh, earlier. So. Excellent. Thank you very much. You also have two questions uh, on methodology by Phoenix. Uh, so we can perhaps split them. So the first one is, how do you use photogrammetry? Do you change the, the direction of the digital light? Do you enhance the height of, in the model or any other way? Yeah, we use, uh, oh, excuse me, we use, uh, we use both the, 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 the turning lights and also we we use uh, filters to um, pop out the the, the, the engravings. So um, you can see there are the, 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 our methodology is published in Journal of Archaeological Science reports, I think. Yeah. So uh, we use uh, Astrend mod, uh, Astrend um, filters and other kind of filters to um, increase the visibility of the of the motifs. Okay. Thank you. And the other question was about. Um, the way you use GIS. So, uh, yeah. did you create a regional GIS or repository to archive all your findings and research? So it's, it's more about conserving data than rather well, analysis. I, I made a um, very modest um, online um, database, uh, which I can give you the, the, the link. Um, but I made it, you know, we, don't, we, ha we haven't found for this. So I made it myself. Um, it's not quite as good as yours, obviously, but at least you can see the position of the of the rock art sites and pinpoint the num and see the number and see with what uh, what kind of figures or what kind of motifs are represented in, in each one of them. So yes, it, it, this is what uh, the only thing we have um, for them for the time being. Probably in the future, uh, if we obtain uh, funds, you know, we will have a properly uh, uh, web, web, uh, website with, uh, with the database and, and the models and so on and so forth. Yeah, that sounds great. Uh, another question about context of rock art. So maybe this is something you partly covered in your, in your slide about chronology, but uh, are there any, or are, I'm sorry, it's a question by Stephen. So are any of those rock shelter sites with art also associated with human burials? No, no. Um, most of them are located in, in also in, in, actually in step uh, hill sites. And there are no, uh, even when we have a, a huge number of, of human burials, especially mounds, we have like more, more or less 4,000 uh, megaliths or uh, or barrows in, in Galicia, um, there are no specific uh, close relationship between um, rock art and, 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 and megalithic tombs. Um, either the 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 the, the, rock, the open air uh, sites and or the uh, the petroglyphs inside rock shelters. So no, and they are small. They are what uh, is what we call taphony are small, really, really small rock shelters, which are really impossible to, you know, you have to, only a, 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 a person can, can go inside and there is a, a lot of wind and, and rain and raining coming inside the, the, the rock shelter. So they were not very good for living and probably for, you know, the for uh, uh, depositing the, 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 the body of a, of a buried relative, so of a dead relative. Yeah, that, that makes sense. Uh, thank you. Uh, the question now from Filipa, do you know if uh, prehistoric people use the same path as are the ones that are present today in the landscape? Well, what we did in order to, to, to check 
the if um, if the, the 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 least cost parts we simulate because these are simulations, computer simulations. We have to bear this in mind. Are computer simulations? They are not real. So we try to 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 see if they match the real traditional um, paths. So we we found that the, the Camino Reales, the royal uh, the royal paths, the royal uh, um, roads, and also the Camino de Santiago, the San Jacques uh, San Jacques Way. And there are many there are many small branches and no branches uh, all around Galicia. And in fact, most of our key points um, are overlay the 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 the, 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 the um, the areas of or the the traces of the of these traditional paths. So we are pretty confident that our that our um, simulated uh, paths are um, pretty much equivalent to the to the to the traditional ones. At, at least the, the data we have on point in that way. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, what tools? made these petroglyphs that's a question from kevin uh, did they use quartz stone tools in galicia so i think that you mentioned yeah. some of them in your in your slides yeah um i i, I haven't had the, the opportunity to, to show one uh, but these are small boulders made of quartzite and quartz mostly okay that is the it's the 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 the, the, the dominant uh, lithology in, in galicia so we have very few flint the flint we have we have comes mostly from from outside Galicia, as far as uh, Andalusia actually, and um, and the, the the tools they use and the one we found are small uh, round cobbles of uh, of quartz and quartzite. We we should not uh, rule out the the use of of maybe metallic uh, metallic uh, artifacts later on time, obviously not only in historical times but also maybe in the Iron Age they were using. Uh, they were using um, uh, metallic uh, instruments. Okay, can I, if I can just follow up on this, when you find those instruments, do you find like use wear on yeah. these instruments? Yeah. Yeah, quite clear. No. The thing, oh, excuse me, see. No, no, oh, go on. Yeah, the thing that um, as, as um, since I am, I, I, half of my scientific production uh, you know, deals with rock art, but the other half deals with uh, with uh, lithic industries. And so, one of the things I was suspecting was uh, these hammers. Okay, these hammers to be used like indirect, indirect percussion. You know, like using like a, I don't know how you call it a cincel. Okay, um, a punch, and then you can um, um, have a much more control control over the 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 the, the, the gestures of of making these petroglyphs. Okay. So it will be easier to, to make, especially for example, the, the the horns in the stacks with all the ramifications, okay, which is quite compl uh, uh, complex to do. So what we found was um, only um, the, 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 these these uh, these uh, hammers have um, the, the, this uh, the, the evidence of, of you know of uh, percussion only. In one, in one of the other sides, suggesting that they use a freehand, uh, a freehand um, um, technique, not a, a not a indirect percussion, if not a freehand. And this is quite interesting because it suggests that these people was quite uh, experienced in doing this kind of, of works. Because um, everybody, um, I, my PhD in my PhD, I, I nap a lot. I made arrowheads and so on. So one of the first things you learn is to hit the same planes twice. <laughs> and it's quite difficult to do that. OK, so the fact that they were using freehand techniques instead of, uh, instead of uh, indirect percussion suggests that they may were um, quite used to do this kind of activities so that for me is quite interesting yeah fantastic i think i think that's that's the same thing that was observed in scotland as well and which which surprised me as well that they were using direct percussion as opposed to indirect ones yeah. for example in in other areas for example in, in there are not a lot of uh, of uh, um papers or information dealing with uh, this kind of instruments and the ones you find for example in Australia they use indirect percussion 
for example. You you can find the the the, the, the these um, punctures. They look like bipolar cores. So with two uh, with two opposite um, um, sets of of uh, of uh, of uh, percussion uh, marks. Okay, but not in Galicia. In Galicia, you have them only in one side. So it's completely different. Yeah, that's that's very interesting. Thank you. Okay, a uh, question from Isabel. How do the Galician petroglyphs relate to Breton ones, uh, particularly those in the Gavrinis tomb, which I remember has been made of granite and including spirals? Yeah, yeah, and these are these new motifs that you find um, that you find Gavrini, for example. They are quite similar to some of these um, of these motifs we have we found, for example, in, in Pozo Ventura in Pontevedra. They are very similar, so it's very difficult. I mean, it's very difficult to to to, to rule out uh, connections, especially when, as you as you know, Serge Cassin has um, mentioned this relationship, for example, in the press uh, um, based on the presence of the representation of sperm whales both in mega in in Breton megaliths and in Galician and North Portuguese megaliths. And so it might well be that, that there are some, there are, uh, there are um, similitudes between both uh, the, these petroglyphs and those in the, in the Breton area. So, and especially when we found that, uh, for example, Iberian body site, that is, which is similar to, uh, to, you know, it's a green rock used for making uh, for making adorns and adornments and, and other kind of um, like um, pendants and so on, and they are found in, in, in Breton megaliths, but they they come from the from the northwest area of, of Spain, from Zamora, which is close to the frontier with North uh, North Portugal and Galicia. Okay, and we found a jade axis in northwestern uh, in northwestern Iberia. So there were connections. We are pretty sure that there were connections. Were these objects were accompanied by um, other metaphysical or ideological um, connections or you know or influences? We don't know, but it seems so. Very good. Uh, thank you. One more question from Martin. Okay. So. What are the dominant animal species depicted in prehistoric rock art? Paleolithic cave art has been interpreted in terms of star constellations, essentially the solstice and the equinox constellations. Uh, uh, at the time, they are painted. The correlation is excellent. Perhaps this rock art is similar. Well, actually, from from um, from most of um, at the beginning of the of, of you know the analysis of the rock of the Galician rock art, these uh, representations were um, thought to be pre uh, to be Paleolithic, you know, because they are clear different uh, similitudes, especially in what uh, was called the the uh, Stilo Cinco of, of the style five, uh, which are pretty schematic uh, animals similar to some extent to those we, we find in, in Galicia. Um, we, we don't know, okay, we don't know what they intend to, to represent with, the, with, the, with, the, with these stacks. What we found is that um, some of them, when they are um, showing a, a relationship with humans, when they are interacting with humans, the human is trying to dominate the, the is trying to to do to, to, to subjugate the the animal okay both trying to hunt to hunt it or trying to ride it actually we have horse not horse deer uh, riding and you know in in, in Galicia we have like maybe a half a dozen representations of um, humans um, riding uh, deer okay so we don't know they might be representing you know this quest for the, the the dominion of the nature okay so it's one thing that we 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 see everywhere when the when the popul when the human communities um, they they embrace the the agriculture life uh, lifestyle 
to say to say in that way, they be, they begin to to represent uh, wild animals. This happen this happens, for example, in Satal Huyuk and in many other places. You know, the, the just in moment they 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 the the the, the hunting is not important for you know for the for the living for the for the diet. Okay, so they they begin to represent the the the, the hunting things and they are wild animals. So as a way of maybe or maybe of um, of depicting the, the 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 superiority of the of human of humans uh, you know against against the the wild uh, nature. So maybe this is what what we have here. This, this is the, the traditional representation, but we don't know actually what what they were uh, trying to represent. What we know is that they the this, the people uh, depicting these these animals had a deep knowledge about about the the ethology of these animals because we they represented you know like uh, um, having sex but also uh, having the, what we call the berrea and the, 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 the screaming and, and sniffing the, the the bats and some kind of things that are you know well um, well no representations of the of the everyday life of the of these animals so yeah Thank you, Carlos. Uh, a question from Alison Sheridan. Oh, so, Alison. <laughs> what, what are your thoughts on the shared designs along the Atlantic facade? Big question. Well, um, as Alison knows, we were part of the, of the Jade project, okay, which was a lovely experience. And it's, it's pretty clear that, uh, that there were connections. We have uh, the same kind of objects, okay? We have, um, we have um, for example, uh, some kind of, um, some uh, castellic uh, pottery back in Galicia. We have uh, also, as I told you, um, um, jade axes found in Galicia. We have just published a, a new axe in, in Northern Galicia. Coming from coming from uh, from Brittany, it's a Tumiak art, uh, Tumiak uh, axe, which can be found mostly in in the Breton area, and then we have the the presence of of Iberian barisite in in the in the Breton mounds. So, if there were connections, and there were connections because because we have the the, the evidences in the in the archaeological record, then. Um, we cannot rule out that these similitudes, this uh, this um, close, uh, you know, um, similitudes between the rock art in, in in Brittany, but also in Ireland or in Scotland, are also a, a result of these connections. Okay, in the Bronze Age, you can find, for example, the, the, the specific kinds of uh, of decoration in the Bell Beaker, both in the, cell, the the major stepstones of the of the Atlantic facade, uh, facade from the uh, from Dan Denmark to the Continental Peninsula in uh, in Normandy to Brittany to um, Galicia to the Douro region, okay, and only them in, in these places, only in, in these places. So, um, and obviously during the Bronze Age, these contacts are growing, you know. And, and we found Irish cauldrons and things like that in, in Galicia and Portugal. So there were a connection, there, there was a connection between you know these land ends, you know, Galicia, the Finisterre, the, the Galician Finisterre, the French Finisterre, the land end. Uh, so when they began, was uh, it's difficult to, to, to establish, but why not in the in the in the Neolithic or in the or in the in the in the, in the end of the Neolithic and the late Neolithic or even in the early Neolithic? So maybe the petroglyphs or the, the connections or the similitudes between rock art is one more of the examples of or the evidences of these connections. Thank you, thank you, uh, Carlos. So. Uh... One more question from uh, Lin. Uh, is there any evidence of later reuse of rock art, such as for yeah. burials, as can be seen in Scotland? Uh, excuse me, the, la the latter part, the, the, the last part? Yeah, I, th I think Lin is referring to evidence in Scotland where you have kissed tombs uh, that were built using quarried rock art. So people who quarry rock art and then built, uh, you know, early Bronze Age tombs with this 
quarried rock art. So do you have something similar in Galicia? No, so far we ha we haven't found any, but maybe in the future. No, no, For, so far no, no, no. And and maybe it's the the I don't know. Well, I I've seen the the, the image the images of the of the Scottish rock art, but um, so these petroglyphs, uh, the Galician petroglyphs are, are engraved actually in. And you know, in quite huge, uh, quite huge rocks, which are quite difficult to, to you know, to <laughs> simply broken and, and, and leave and, and and take the piece with it with you. So, no, we we haven't found, but maybe in the future. That's great, thank you. Uh, a practical question from Rick: uh, Are mm -hmm. most of these sites open to the public, or are they on private yes. lands? Well. Um, mo most uh, <laughs> most of them are in private lands, but I I, I think it's quite safe to go there. Okay, so we, we, you are not going to be shot shot or something like that, you know. <laughs> but if you want to go, and uh, there is a place, there is an um, uh, um, archaeological park. Uh, actually, in, in the major in the major cluster of petroglyphs, which is in Campo Lameiro, Campo Lameiro in Pontevedra, near to Pontevedra, okay, and near to the if you if you like wine, it's near also to the to the um, to the um, Albariño region, okay, white, white wines, and then you there you have um, a little museum, and then you you can go and visit like. Um, 40 or 50 uh, rock art sites, some of them quite spectacular, like uh, La Sia um, dos Carvalhos, which has a stack which is like um, one meter and a half. So, and you can go either by day or by night, since you can visit also during the night. So, I strongly recommend you to, to visit the area. We will. And um, maybe, yeah, maybe a few more questions if you still have some energy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, question from Peter uh, Is there any evidence of painted rock art? And then there was another question which is related to this one, is, which was whether you've used things like distretched, for example, in your survey. I, since I'm, I spent part of my research career in in the states and in Arizona, where you know they use a lot of this kind of stretch, uh, the stretch um, tool, and we use that. We use it, um, but but not for detecting uh, engravings, which uh, is, is not it doesn't work in the in the in the Galician petroglyphs. But we use it for trying to establish different kinds of oxidations. Which might, for example, reveal different kinds of exposition to the to the um, to the weathering, to the to the um, to rain and so on and so forth. So um, we didn't we didn't use um, or we haven't used the stretch for that. Okay, not for for detecting new uh, engravings, but for other things regarding the presence of of paintings. This is a question always appears and and rightly so because if you go to the to the megalithic art of northwestern iberia um, they are both paintings and engravings and in many cases for example dombate they were first engraved and then painted painted so make sense to ask this kind of question and we haven't we haven't found uh, evidence of picture of, of paintings, okay, even inside uh, the rock shelters, okay, which, uh, you know, because you, you one can say, well, there, there was no painting, there, there are no paintings because the paintings was simply washed away by the, the by the rain. But when we found in, 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 in petroglyphs, uh, well, we look in petroglyphs, we were buried uh, or inside the rock shelters, we, we didn't find these evidences of, of paintings. What we saw is that the, the, the technique, and, and, and we, can, we, we couldn't see this in the, in, the, in the open air rock art because of the erosion, but the petroglyphs with are in, that are in, inside uh, rock art shelters, the cap marks are, are made different, are made using different techniques. They are polished. If you touch the, the, the cap marks, they are completely polished. Or polished, like a, you know, like a like a, um, a stone axe. 
but we 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 didn't find the evidences of of painting, and we we look for. Believe me, we we look for, and and we have quite experienced uh, researchers. For example, Fernando Carrera, which is a renowned expert in megalithic uh, paintings, and he 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 didn't found he didn't find the paintings also. So um, it seems quite clear that the the, the petroglyphs were uh, were not painted, but. Um, if you if you compare if you try to to to, to make an engrave, uh, engraving a petroglyph in a in a dark uh, rock, the the freshly made the, the freshly made roof is quite quite visible. You don't need paint, right? at least in the moment where, where the petroglyphs were made, because they are clearly visible. You know they, the the contrast between the the, the, the dark uh, surface of the of the rock and the new this new uh, fr uh, this freshly made uh, groups is, is is evident is quite clear. Mm -hmm. you know? So you don't need the paint. Excellent. This is very interesting. Um, so I'm going to ask you one final question, which should be should be straightforward to answer. It's a question from uh, Ivan. Who is asking about the six-pointed star motif that is found at Foxa da Vella, and she's asking whether this oh. particular motif it can is found elsewhere as well. No, no, this is um, this is, uh... unicum. No, no, no. This no. Um, I told you about the I told you about the um, I told you about the the, the historical uh, motifs. Foxa da Vella has both prehistoric. And historic uh, motives. Okay, they were um, this the the, the Fossa da Bella, For example, we we found crosses, and also we found we found a, a David star. Okay, a, a Estrella David. Okay, and but these are these are we don't know the chronology, uh, but uh, maybe medieval, uh, you know, may, medieval onwards. So uh, they are not prehistoric. Okay, they are historic, and there is no doubt about it. The, the, the groups are completely different, completely different. Okay, so so no doubt of the of this star, this uh, six point star is 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 uh, actually the representation of the of the, the the star of David. So maybe some kind of uh, because this um, in the in the local folklore, the this the petroglyphs were when you know are um, are. Um, Related with a semi-mythical, no semi-mythical, a mythical figure called the the, the Mouros, the Moors, okay, and and they were uh, such they were Christianized, and sometimes you find weird things like, for example, doves, as we saw, doves, and sometimes we found also these uh, these six-point stars. So, but they are clearly historic, not prehistoric. Okay, very good. So uh, I think that's the uh, we should put to an end to this to this fantastic discussion. So thank you so much, Carlos, for such a brilliant talk, so interesting, and uh, thank you very much to everybody in the audience for for listening. Thank you so much for your nice questions. I, I'm sure you've enjoyed a lot this presentation tonight. And before before we close this seminar, I just wanted to. Uh, announce our next talk which will take place on monday the 28th of may which will be given by dr lara barcela alves and the, the presentation will be again uh, on iberian rock arts and the, the presentation will be entitled redesigning european rock art from the outside edge the confluence of prehistoric art traditions in northwest iberia so all the information is on the Scotland's Rock Art website if you need any further details. And uh, again, you can access the recording of previous webinars on the website. So thank you. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you very much, Carlos. And you. see you all uh, in a few weeks. Thank you, Carlos. That was great. I don't know if you see in the uh, in the chat. We actually have Richard Bradley with us.